It's a celebration here in the studio because the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast is a winner. Thanks to the Cybersecurity Excellence Awards for awarding us a Best Cybersecurity Podcast gold medal in our category. Yeah. We're celebrating, but we're giving all of you the gift. We're once again giving away a free month of our InfoSec Skills platform, which features targeted learning modules, cloud-hosted cyber ranges, hands-on projects, certification practice exams, and skills assessments. To take advantage of this special offer for CyberWork listeners, head over to infosecinstitute.com skills, or click the link in the description below. Sign up for an individual subscription as you normally would, then in the coupon box, type the word CyberWork, C-Y-B-E-R-W-O-R-K, no spaces, no capital letters, and just like magic, you can claim your free month. Thank you once again for listening to and watching our podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you coming back each week. So enough of that, let's begin the episode. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Alyssa Knight has had a lot of accolades and accomplishments in her career. She was walked off her high school grounds by law enforcement for hacking a government server. She showed the heads of several financial organizations as she hacked their APIs in front of them. She wrote an entire book about the surprising ease of hacking connected cars. But all of these pale before the most important honor. She's our very first three-peat guest on CyberWork. Yes! Uh, she sh- <laughs> uh, we talked about APIs and hacking cars in our previous episodes. I'm, you know, sort of previewing that, and I encourage you to go back and check those episodes out because they were a blast. Uh, so, um, but today we are going to talk to Alyssa about Alyssa. Uh, as we for this episode, we are in the last few days of Pride Month. As Alyssa, Alyssa said in previous episodes, she is transgender and a lesbian, uh, neither of which on their own is particularly prevalent in cybersecurity or the tech industry as a whole, and in combination, uh, rarer still. InfoSec believes that cybersecurity work should not just be open to people of all genders, races, orientations, and experiences, uh, but that a real effort should be made to intentionally and aggressively uh, bring people of device, diverse backgrounds and experiences into the industry. This benefits everyone. Not only do we believe jobs and careers in the cybersecurity industry are satisfying and rewarding for all, uh, but as a field that is intrinsically uh, understanding that problems get solved and threats are avoided by listening to and considering a variety of points of view, uh, the entire industry, I believe, is improved by not just uh, bringing a diverse workforce in, but listening to and absorbing their experiences and the approaches they bring. Uh, So we're going to cover a lot of territory today. We're going to talk about Alyssa's latest book, and yes, that is a third book, and is her autobiography. Uh, We are going to talk about her work hacking Bluetooth LE smart device. Oh, look at there. Hacking connected cars. (laughs) Hacking connected cars. Uh, We're also going to talk about uh, her work hacking Bluetooth LE smart devices and her new company, Night Inc., uh, and a new concept she's created called adversarial content. Can't wait to hear about that. Alyssa Knight is a recovering hacker of 20 years, blending hacking with a unique style of written and verbal content creation for challenger brands and market leaders in cybersecurity. Alyssa is a cybersecurity influencer, content creator, and community manager as a partner at Knight Inc. that provides vendor go-to market and content strategy for telling brand stories at scale in cybersecurity. Alyssa is also the principal analyst in cybersecurity at Alyssa Knight and Associates. Catchy name. Alyssa is a published author through her publisher at Wiley, having published her first book on hacking connected cars and recently received two new book contracts to publish her autobiography and a new book on hacking APIs. As a serial entrepreneur, Alyssa has started and sold two cybersecurity companies to public companies in international markets and also sits as the group CEO of Briar and Thorne, a managed security service provider, MSSP. Alyssa, welcome back to CyberWork. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> now that I, now that I've uh, uh, taken up five minutes of your time with uh, Adley, uh, <laughs> that was that was quite a mouthful, but I appreciate it. Uh, so I know it's 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 my fault. It's 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 my it's, incredibly it, long history. Of it's extreme. your it's your fault for being so uh, uh, so so productive. <laughs> I, I've tried to do as much as I can as quickly as I can in my life. Right. So, uh, so let's do the opposite of what we normally do on the show. Usually I ask guests about their cybersecurity journey, which we, you know, the original inspiration was, and you know, you've told us plenty about that. So uh, I'm going to flip this around because I know we're going to get to your autobiography later. So let's talk about some things you're up to right now. Uh, when we last spoke, you were just working on an API security book and it sounds like that's still in progress. So how's that coming along? And for those who haven't, weren't, didn't listen to the old episodes and if not, shame on you, but uh, tell us uh, what, what that's all about. <laughs> 
Yeah, so uh, Wiley is my publisher, and they, um, they, the, the, the first book that I uh, had published under them, Hacking Connected Cars, uh, has been very successful. Uh, we are actually, so they just issued a new contract to me for uh, an autobiography and an API security book. Um, the API security book uh, is going well. I, I have no idea why I signed up to try and write two books at the same time. I have no idea what I'm, I think that's kind of my, uh, that's my, my theme of my life though, right? Like I, yeah. I never have any idea what it is I'm doing. Um, you're, and I always you're building your wings on the way chew. down is, is uh, <laughs> uh, what his name said, uh, Ray Bradbury. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm building your wings on the way down. Yeah. Figure out as you go, right? Uh, trial yep. by fire. Yep. Um, so I'm, I'm in the process of, of writing that book and I'm also in the progress of, uh, in the process of writing my autobiography. Cool. So, um, first I wanted to ask about the, the hacking connected car book, you know, you said the reception was good. Have you heard of any companies that have changed their protocols or factory requirements based on the concrete examples you cited in the book? You know, it was, it was great. I, I actually had several people reach out to me on, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, letting me know how the book has changed their internal processes or actually mm. defined uh, processes at their organizations. Um, so one of the things uh, that w I was really intrigued to find out was um, the head of a company that is building and putting on the street autonomous vehicles, um, the head of cybersecurity, vehicle cybersecurity, reached out to me to let me know that they are actually using my book uh, to perform penetration testing of their autonomous vehicles. So that was incredibly cool. Um, yeah. To know that something that I've written is influencing such a huge company uh, yeah. and the, the vehicles that they're putting on the street. Um, several car makers, several tier one OEMs have reached out to let me know that they've made it required reading at their companies for their engineers, for their vehicle security teams. So it's, it's great. You know, to me, it's not really about the quantity, um, but the quality, uh, and, and the impact oh, yeah. that I'm making. Right. Right. Um, you know, yeah, I'm not, those are I didn't concrete set changes. Out, yeah, I didn't set out to be, you know, a New York Times bestseller. This is a very niche area, <laughs> sure. um, yeah. you know, uh, of it, people interested in, in hacking connected cars. Um, and, you know, the, the neat thing is I did get told that um, we've already uh, sold over a thousand books. So wow. over a thousand copies have, have shipped. And uh, so it's doing quite well. Um, so there's quality and quantity, I guess. <laughs> I love it. So can you, I, we talked about the API book in the previous episode. Can you, can you talk me through the sort of the scope of that? Like what is, what is yeah. the actual sort of, uh, um, I mean, API is obviously, you know, you, you found some insecurities. So tell me about them. Just a few. Just a few. Uh, so, uh, you know, as you know, last year, I went on this sort of global tour talking about the 30 financial services mobile apps that are reverse engineered and found hard-coded API keys and tokens. And uh, I recently, if you've been following my YouTube channel, and if you haven't, please subscribe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I published a video where I actually hacked a European bank and, and the bank was kind enough to allow me to, to actually film that and record it and actually publish it. So, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of vulnerability research and hacking APIs and there really isn't any content out there on hacking APIs, right? So you've got the OWASP API top 10. If you go out right. there and Google it and if you think about it, the, the Hacking Connected Cars book, the impetus to me writing that book was because there is such a lack of content out there for Hacking Connected Cars. Yes. And so, you know, for me, I guess the banner that I fly is wanting to be a content creator for content that really doesn't exist. I like to really chart new, really just go off the beaten path and chart new, chart new uh, uh, journeys uh, and content that really doesn't exist out there. So this w made sense for an API security book. Um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm really wanting to get this book out a lot more quickly than my first book. Right. When I walked into my first book, I was thinking, oh yeah, I'll just kick you know, one chapter out a week, I'll be done in 10 weeks. Uh, three years later, it finally mm -hmm. came out. I'm walking into this with more experience as a published author, knowing how long books take, knowing that you need to write every single day, knowing that it's, it, it's, you know, just slow, just progression, even if it's not yeah. 
writing an entire chapter every day, writing just a little, maybe one page, maybe two pages. And that's my advice for those aspiring authors out there who are writing a book. You need to write at least a little every day, even if you're not in the mood to write. You're not going to wake up wanting to write. You, right. you have to force yourself to write. And that's a big lesson that I learned in writing the first book. So this API book, I'm going to try, my, my goal is to get it out a lot more quickly. Cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you were saying that you've sort of uh, are going in sort of uncharted areas and, and API security wasn't really a thing people were talking about per se, right? Right. Correct. So, you know, it's, it's uh, to me, adversaries go where the money is and yeah. their, their, their mission is to monetize data, right? Data is worth more than oil. People have heard me say that before. Mm-hmm. And that's where, that's what API is. That, that's their mission in life is to right. provide data uh, to API consumers, whether it's a mobile app or a connected car, everything is pretty much connect, connected to and connected with APIs. Right. Uh, the internet of things, internet of everything, their backend are API servers. So hackers know this. Their goal in life is to steal data and monetize it. How can they monetize it? And so I can't imagine something that's a more contemporary issue than APIs. If you look yeah. at all the breaches recently, whether, you know, like the Apache struts vulnerability that, that got Equifax, um, mm-hmm. the Mara breach, all of these API vulnerabilities and API breaches I can't imagine a more perfect time to get this book out. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, you know, you've, you've defended the entire castle, but there's one weird door in the back that someone forgot exactly. to leave exactly. unlock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So uh, again, jumping from there to your other, uh, you know, recent moves, because, you know, I, I emailed you a few different places before I realized that you had uh, set up business for yourself here. So tell me a little bit. I'm the queen that. of rotating email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like this one, wait five minutes. There's another one exactly, coming. Um, exactly. <laughs> so tell me about Night Inc. And so for those who can't see my questions uh, printed out, it's Night K N I G H T and then I N K like ink and an ink yeah. pen is in writing. It gets everyone. Uh, so in the previous episode, we talked about your move toward writing in the hashtag you know hashtag Night Writers. Uh, so clearly, writing is still at the center of what you do. Could you tell me about what Night Inc. is up to at the moment and what some of your other vulner- vulnerability research is doing at the moment? Yeah, so so some of uh, my followers know and began actually following me when I was an analyst at IT Group. Uh, I have since left IT. Uh, I there was a difference of direction, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so I wanted to be a content creator. So I started a content marketing firm called Night Inc. Uh, Just like you mentioned, the play on words of I and K. I see myself as a writer at heart. um, So Night Inc. I and K made sense. Uh, so what I do at INC is I create content assets for cybersecurity vendors, specifically cybersecurity challengers, uh, challenger brands, and market leaders in cybersecurity. So I typically only work with cybersecurity vendors. What I do is I create white papers, blogs, videos, whatever the content asset is, infographics. And the unique nature of the content that I create is that it comes from the lens of a former hacker. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I like to say that I'm a recovering hacker of 20 years. So the content that I create is from that perspective of an adversary, which right. is how I coined the term adversarial content. So vendors who want their story told from the perspective of an adversary, wanting that story to be why people need their product versus what it does, which is what I think CISOs and buyers care most about is, you know, adversarial content is the best way to tell that story. Right. Uh, Adversarial content by definition from uh, my perspective is content that is created from the perspective of an adversary, meaning that I'll hack a technology, hack a product, hack an endpoint, and show how that technology would have prevented that Mm. from happening, would have detected or prevented it. So it shows interested buyers that this technology does exactly what the marketing material says it does. That if uh, this is an EDR technology, this is how it actually stood up to an active attack from an adversary. So yeah, it's the, the, 
idea, the concept has really taken off. I work with a lot of the major brands out there um, in cybersecurity telling their story. I believe that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. It's Simon Sinek. So that's what I do with adversarial content. Okay. So yeah. So just to make sure that I'm sort of getting it my, right in my, you know, in my head, like a regular review would say, uh, you know, this product in theory should do this, this, and this. And you're saying I tried to hack in using this way. And because of this product, I wasn't able to, or if it had been better, I, 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 you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to, but I was able to something like that. Exactly. Right. So, you know, um, one of the things that I do is I work with my clients and, and help them create what's called Blue Ocean Strategy. And if no one's read that book, Blue Ocean Strategy was written by two MBAs out of Harvard Business School who wrote the story really around the, the, this concept that you eliminate your competition by making it irrelevant. And Blue Ocean Strategy is the idea very much like Cirque du Soleil who didn't set out to create a better circus, they set out to reinvent what the circus was. Right. So I help companies find their blue ocean. Hmm. To me, features of a product are a moving target. Um, you know, it, any company can put a white paper out there and see what their features are. And to me, that doesn't really resonate at a visceral level with buyers and with CISOs like adversarial content would, where you're showing, okay, this is, an, uh, this is what a an attack against an API endpoint in the case of Salt Security, uh, which is one of my clients, is this is how, uh, uh, what it looks like when your API is being breached and this is how this technology detected it and prevented it from happening. So I think that with so many solutions out there on the market, that CISOs are looking for a different kind of content. If you think about it, more than 64% of buyers today make their purchase decisions off of custom content, meaning that 64% of those interested in the services of InfoSec Institute aren't finding out about you guys like clicking on banner ads or click on Google ads. They're, they're making their decisions off of the videos, the podcasts, the, the papers, the blog articles, all of the custom content out there. I believe that that is the future of advertising. I believe that that traditional Google ads, AdWords, whatever it may be is dead. And yeah. that custom content is the future of marketing. Yeah. And all of you who are doing exactly what Alyssa said with us. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Good job. <laughs> um, so, uh, so uh, yeah. Can you tell me uh, some, some, some juicy bits from your autobiography? What kind of stuff, uh, yeah. Are I'm we going to cover here? Let's. I'm excited, uh, you know, let's, and I let's, have to be careful. A little bit, not not too much, but just a little bit for the readers. Yeah, yeah, and I, I have to be careful because uh, uh, I got to take care of my boy Jim Minnetel over at Wiley. Um, okay. Yes, uh, of course. So, yeah. So uh, great guy, by the way, cool cat. Um, yeah. So. Wiley doesn't publish autobiographies. It's, it's so technically I can't call it that. It is a right. non-fictional narrative. There you <laughs> so, go. Yeah. So I am writing yeah, it's, it's a non-fictional a squishy, narrative. It's a real yeah. squishy territory between memoir, yeah. Yeah. autobiography, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but uh, so yeah, it's it's really it's it's my coming up story. It's it's mm -hmm. my former life and my former skin. Uh, you know, as Eric Hines, uh, and. And that's um, well, so weird to say that name. Uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, my transition uh, really sort of becoming Loki, uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, I transitioned in 2008. And my journey is a trans woman in a, a male dominated world, uh, male dominated industry. Uh, in cybersecurity, sorry, my world is cybersecurity. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, what that experience has been like. Uh, just, it, it's interesting for me because it's a very, uh, it's a very unique perspective being able to say that I've lived my life as two completely different sexes, two completely different genders, um, you know, and, and living my life as a man and then living my life as a woman. Uh, it's very interesting because you don't really prepare for that. You don't prepare because as a man, you read about the inequality of, of men and women in the workplace, the wage disparity, um, being passed up for job opportunities in the workplace as a woman over a man with the same or less credentials or experience, it's a real thing. And I didn't prepare myself for what that would be like. Um, and it's, it's, you would hope that an industry as, as, you know, um, 
new is cybersecurity? Because if you think about it, cybersecurity isn't very old. It's right. not like, you know, um, steel like mill or something. Or, yeah. yeah, or <laughs> banking uh, or investing. It's, it's, a, it's a nascent industry mm-hmm. that we are trying to figure out as we go. Right. And uh, so you would think it would be more progressive uh, when it comes to equality and inclusion. And it's not, you know, and I, you know, there was a tweet storm that occurred. And I think you brought it up in a previous episode where I got involved in a, tw- uh, a thread that actually became my most viral tweet. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was a, about a, a, a gentleman who made the, made the statement that cybersecurity moves too fast for women oh, right. um, and, and uh, that women would rather be at home and be homemakers and be family oriented versus being in cybersecurity. And it was shocking to me because this is, this is a very prevalent narrative. Um, for some reason, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that believe that, you know, hey, uh, cybersecurity isn't for women and here's why. Um, I always try and play devil's advocate. I always try and look at it from other people's perspective. Um, but it's hard to find logic yeah. in a lot of the things I'm reading. Sure. When it comes from, you know, and, and I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I think, um, there's a lot of things that people need to be educated on when it comes to not just women issues, but trans issues. Like, you know, there's this belief, and I hear it a lot, that, uh, trans women shouldn't be allowed to participate in women only sports. Right. That's so stupid to me, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, it's, and I think it was actually Seth Rogen's podcast where he actually talked about this. Um, and, and the narrative is being spread a lot. I, I can understand, I think, um, from that perspective, but people don't understand that when you go through HRT, uh, your upper body strength as a as a man as a man's body gets depleted, mm. uh, you know your your upper body strength pretty much goes away and deteriorates. Um, there are women on the tennis court. I used to be um, a competitive. I used to play tennis competitively and go to tournaments. And there's women biological women that could kick my ass on the tennis court, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they're biological women um, that have much more upper body strength than me. Um, And, you know, I, I just think it's, and I don't think it's, it's ignorance. I think it's education. It's, 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 you know, a learning curve. Yeah. And like, like, for example, um, martial arts, you Mm -hmm. know, there are biological women that could wipe the floor with me, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, you know, so I think, I think it's educating people and understanding, um, and also the unique perspectives, and we'll probably talk about the blog article here in a minute, the unique perspectives right. that the LGBTQ community brings to teams, brings to the workplace, yeah. um, that, uh, that, that you may not find in a less inclusive culture. Right. Now I want to jump back to a phrase. You've, you've said it a couple of times. You said you, you becoming Loki, you want to sort of talk about, I assume you're talking about the, the, the sort of Norse God, the Marvel character. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, um, I'm a little rusty. He's Loki. Loki's the sort of a chaos agent, right? Or Yeah. He's yeah. And it's funny because obviously that name was, was a handle I chose as a man. Um, okay. uh, but you know, Loki can be a woman. Um, okay. so. <laughs> but, but yeah, so what, what does that mean? Be, becoming Loki? Yeah. So, uh, becoming Loki is really just, um, for me outside of the Marvel, um, franchise, um, you know, is, it was my hacker alias. Mm. Uh, there was actually a very famous, um, or infamous, uh, hacker tool called Loki, mm-hmm. um, which was an ICMP communication backdoor. Um, but, uh, so becoming Loki, Loki. For, yeah, becoming <laughs> Loki was really just how, just my, my growing up story, my coming up story, um, in, in my life from when I started hacking at 13 to, you know, where I am now, uh, in my, in my journey, where I am now in, in, in my career, where, you know, I'm now no longer in the bash shell, so to speak, you know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm taking those lessons learned and taking that, the, those life stories, uh, and applying it in a different way, um, through content. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, do you, is there still that sense of like uh, being this sort of chaos agent or this being this sort of like 
this mischief maker in the yeah in the yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you know I've, i and it's funny because there's um uh there's a painter a famous painter by the name of fabian perez mm. and uh I, I i collect paintings and one of the things that i do is he created this a painting, this piece called Untitled. And, and it's this beautiful painting where you see a bunch of men in black trench coats and hats and fedoras facing one way, right? It's kind of like the Apple commercial that became very famous. Um, and there's another gentleman who's wearing completely different clothes and facing the opposite way. And so I bought that painting because I very much saw it as myself. So there was this yeah. change agent, you know, that this wow. not going against the grain or right. sorry, going against the grain, not following uh, the masses. Um, and that's really been my life. And I, I couldn't imagine more, uh, a more fitting hacker alias than Loki is the yeah. God of mischief, the God right. of chaos, you know, and creating chaos. Um, I, if you look at my career, um, you know, I, I discovered the first vulnerability in hacking VPNs and published it on bug track in 2000. It was wow. a rapid stream vulnerability. I spoke about a second vulnerability that I had discovered in hacking VPNs and spoke about it at black hat briefings in 2001. I lost my job as a result of presenting that, that vulnerability. Hmm. Um, uh, the company wanted to put a gag on me talking about it, um, refuted it, um, did everything they could because they were in the middle of being acquired by Avaya. And this company was called VPNet. And so, you know, if you look at my career from wanting to just create waves and be a disruptor, you know, is, is you know, the, the becoming Loki and the, the, the alias Loki was so fitting. And yeah. uh, to this day, you know, I, I, I've always wanted to be bigger than life. And, right. and this has been my narrative. Nice. And that's the name, that's the title of the book as well, then Becoming Loki is the autobiography. Yeah. So that's, okay. that's, that's what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm hoping there won't be any, uh, <laughs> any USPTO uh, trademark uh, issues uh, with Marvel and, and doing that. I'm going to spell oh, yeah. elite spell L zero K one. So, Oh, there you go. Yeah. I mean, so we'll 2022 see. 2022 from Wiley Press. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Exactly. Or whenever. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah by the time I want to talk to you because, you know, we always have fun talking, but I also wanted to talk to you we'll because, uh, uh, you know, we're recording at this, this at the end of June, it's probably not coming out until July, early August, but you know, we're at the end of pride month here. And as you teased out a little bit, I want to talk about LGBTQ plus, you know, people in the cybersecurity industry. Uh, you know, you've written, you written, wrote this really nice article on the topic for our InfoSec resources site. Uh, you know, by the time this comes out, it'll be on the site and I hope you all check it out, uh, where you laid out plenty of reasons why it's not only a benefit for the cybersecurity industry to bring a large assortment of uh, people of differing backgrounds, gender, ethnic, people with and without physical disability into the arena. But uh, can you also talk more about the ways in which not doing so is actively hobbling in the industry? Yeah, so I, and, and I, I, it was an awesome opportunity to write that article. And I appreciate InfoSec Institute and you for making me making that available to me to, to participate in. Uh, and, and I really started out with shame on me because my whole career, my whole life, I've, when I say my whole life, I mean my life starting from 2008 when I transitioned, right. uh, I was 29 years old. Um, I'm 41 today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know. A lot older than I look. Um, and, uh, um, I mean, I'm exactly. <laughs> you look great. Chris. Oh. Um, okay. You know, I've always, I've never wanted being transgendered to be part of my narrative. I, right. I never wanted to be a beautiful trans woman. I wanted to be a beautiful woman. And so I really, if those who follow me, know that I've never really talked that much about being trans. I mean, I think I have uh, one article out of the 50 plus articles or 60 articles I have on LinkedIn called um, Becoming a Listenite. And there's a video on it um, that shows my transition Mm. through pictures. And um, that's the only time I've talked about it. And it's because I've never really wanted it to be part of my story. Now, Chris, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with trans people who do make it part of their narrative. Right. Who go on Twitter and talk about it. No, for sure. Um, they're, they're, they're great people and it's awesome. I, that just has not been me. I don't go to trans support groups. Right. I don't, I, I, when I, you know, I think everyone should have a therapist, somebody to talk to. When I go see my therapist and talk to my therapist, I don't talk about the fact that I'm trans or, you know, woe is me, I'm trans. But shame on me because I should have talked about it more. Um, you know, every year 
uh, there's a huge suicide rate and a huge murder rate of trans yeah. people. Yes. And that needs to change. One life is too many. And the children who are committing suicide because, you know, that girl who threw herself in front of a semi truck because her parents weren't accepting of the fact that she was trans. Yeah. Shame on me for not being more vocal and being more out there about the fact that I'm trans. And despite the fact that I'm trans, the success that I've had in my career, to be able to be that story to trans people that just because you're trans, it doesn't mean that you have to work in the adult entertainment business. Just right. because you're trans doesn't mean that you have to be a, a sex worker. Um, you can have a white collar job. You can have, you can be success, successful in business despite being trans. Um, and, and how far you go in this life is dependent on you and not being able to to accept no mm -hmm. being able to accept no because of the fact that you're transgendered or um gay or a lesbian or whatever your your identification is yeah. Uh, so in working towards uh, solutions to these systemic and long-term problems, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes helps to start with the outcome we want and to sort of see it and reverse engineer our way towards from, you know, where we are now. So can we sort of talk about what in your mind is the ideal outcome for people of diverse gender and sexual orientation uh, having a place at the table specifically in cybersecurity? I mean, what would it look like, not just on a hiring level or you know, numbers or whatever, but as a, as an office culture, as a culture of collaboration and information sharing, like what are some ways, you know, not just in hiring, but at all levels that we can move towards this outcome, do you think? Yeah. I mean, what, what I, what I want people to understand is there's definitely companies to hiring managers to understand is there's a difference between equality and inclusion. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so I think the move in right direction is doing more than just changing your logo to a rain to rainbow stripes. Right. during pride month companies that are doing that um you need to ask yourself the hard question beyond making our logo a rainbow what have we done to be a more inclusive culture right. um beyond just being uh, you know uh, providing equality you know in in our culture but including uh lgbtq plus in the conversation at a place at the table, um, being part of that. You, you, um, in the previous question, you asked, you know, what, what does that look like? What, um, what are those contributions? And, you know, one of the things I can tell you is while there's a lot of research that's been published around women and um, d the disabled being part of um, that inclusive culture, uh, there isn't much on LGBTQ plus inclusion. It mm. wasn't until June of 2020, this month, that the Supreme wow. Court ruled on protections in the workplace for LGBTQ plus people. Right. It's 2020, Chris, and this, the Supreme Court is just now acting on this. Um, on the on the anniversary of the Pulse nightclub massacre, you know Trump rolls back trans protections in healthcare. You know, um, so I think that that conversation needs to continue to be had yes. outside of June. And right. I think though, you know, one of the things that I can say is because even though so because there isn't much research being published on this. I can only offer my opinion. Sure. My opinion is that in hiring LGBTQ plus uh, team members, that they do provide a different perspective. Let me explain. Okay. Um, when you have a minority, when you have a, a, a individuals on your team who are a member of a minority that are not only just persecuted, but sought out and killed, or how they identify, meaning until straight people can, you know, are found tied up to the back of a car and dragged until they're killed, strung up from a tree for being straight, they're, they're, that understanding just wouldn't be there. Um, you know, I, it's, it's going to continue to be that way, meaning that the, a common question I get is, why do gay people need a parade? I don't see straight people having a parade. Well, it's because you're not killed for being straight. You're not passed up on job opportunities for being straight. 
we need those parades. We need that recognition because of how many people kill themselves every year for being LGBT. How many people are passed up and lose out on opportunities because uh, they're LGBT. Um, In my experience, I believe, this is my opinion, I believe that people who are a member of the LGBT community have a different perspective. They provide a different perspective to problem solving uh, because of those decades of persecution, because of the challenges that they have in their lives, force themselves as uh, just are impelled to go above and beyond yeah. what their straight peers would do. Um, it's almost like we have something to prove in the workplace. So we take it further. We go the distance. We give 200% right. because we want to change and prove those conscious and unconscious biases wrong. Right. So, well, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like you know, the... the also, the, you're, you're just having to solve problems much more often all the time anyway just yeah we're constantly yeah yeah we're constantly trying to solve problems that are created and are 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 brought to us yeah yeah Mm -hmm. so you know i feel like you know where's where straight people don't have those challenges in life where for example walking down the street and trying not to look gay or walking down the street and trying to look not look trans right. um the, the, in trying to constantly solve problems we bring a unique perspective to team problem solving in companies um where maybe we're groomed and it's in our DNA to try and constantly solve problems yeah. and come up with creative ways to do it. I don't know. I, is there any empirical data or any scientific data that I can point at that's, that proves that? No, I, 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 there isn't. Yeah. It's my but we're opinion. We're not going to find out unless we try. Yeah. Right. It's my opinion. Um, you yeah. know, uh, I'm not saying that straight people can't solve problems or creative. Oh, stuff. So trolls put your guns down. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just saying that from my perspective, you know, what Briar and Thorne were a women led organization. Mm-hmm. Every single person in our management team is a woman. Um, you know, we are more than 50% LGBTQ. Uh, I have seen instances where the are the member team members who are LGBT in our in our company have brought very unique perspectives, very unique solutions to problems that our straight team members didn't come up with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not. I'm not saying that they're better. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that maybe there's something in our DNA. Maybe yeah. there's something in our day to day life challenges that that brings that. Yeah. And also just cybersecurity is, is such about thinking outside the box. It's so about problem it solving. Is. It's so about like finding the most unlikely answer. And, and like, you know, whether you're, you know, whether you were seven, you know, playing Infocom text games or what, you know, whatever, like it always comes when you're like, I had never thought of that from that perspective. And you do that yeah. by talking to other people, you learn like other yeah. experiences, uh, accessibility issues. If you have differently abled people on your staff, um, but to go back to um, what I was saying before, I think there's also, in, there needs to be sort of like a distinction made between saying, oh, we'd be cool with having LGBTQ people in our staff versus actually like seeking it out, you know, like those yeah. are two very different things saying, oh, hey, we're inclusive. We definitely don't mind having you here. But that's a lot different from saying like, we're going to actively, you know, look for you. We're going walk to find walk. you. We're walk going to find talk. you where you are, and and you know, Seek you whatever out. that whatever that means, you know. So, yeah. it, do you have a sense of of like how one sort of makes the the jump from from A to B? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, for me, it's, and I know it brings up that whole that whole token debate. Like, are you the token LGBT or token right, woman? Right. I, I I hate that. Is I guess at the end of the day, yes, you know screw it. Yeah, it's Mm -hmm. fine. You know, uh, if that's, if that's what it is, then that's what it is. But we need to be purposeful about that. Um, if you want to talk, call it a token position, then fine. Um, if that changes things and that changes, changes the world, then fine, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think the, the move from point A to point B is saying we have a position currently staffed by an LGBT, uh, uh, individual we are going to replace them if they resign or if they are terminated with a new LGBT LGBT individual. Right. Um, 
I don't know. You know, I mean, it, I, something yeah. has to be done. You know, sure. I mean, and it's not like you can go out there and say <laughs> on the job posting LGBT uh, uh, only, only apply. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that, but I mean, right. If if we can do something to change that curve, if we can do something to change that percentage, it needs to be done um, because of these advantages, because of these things that that I feel like we bring to the discussion as yeah. a, a member of the LGBT, LGBT community. Yeah, and and I think also maybe some of that is is having some kind of you know mentorship program inside you know the company or having you know right. sort of alternate spaces and things like that because you know again like you say whether you consider yourself, you know, a token member of the group or not, like it's, it's going to be unusual if you're the only person there or, you know, and, yeah. and, and it's, and it, it's also different when, you know, I think people of all sorts of backgrounds, it's like, it's, if you have that one thing that you're interested in, you have four other people at your job that have that as well, then you have this sort of cohesion and, that, that helps things. And this is on a much larger level than that, obviously, but and, I think it's yeah, important. And, and Chris, change comes from the top, right? I mean, yeah. it's reinforced by leadership. Um, right. You know, what companies can do definitely, it's like, okay, maybe um, as well as having a booth at RSA or having a booth at, at Black Hat Briefings, maybe they have a booth at an LGBT conference. Maybe right. they have a booth at a trans conference. Yeah. Maybe they sponsor uh, uh, an LGBT conference. There yeah. are a lot of LGBT conferences, right. where is the corporate sponsorship at yeah. those events? Yeah. In cybersecurity. Right. Where is it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, they'll have their graphics designers change their logo to a rainbow, but where is where are they putting money where their mouth is? Where are right. where are instances and evidence of them getting involved in supporting the LGBT community? Um, you know, it, reinforcing the creation uh, of LGBT clubs within the company, right. LGBT sport events, um, LGBT softball games, whatever, you know, I mean, something that says, okay, if you don't support LGBT rights and inclusion at our company, guess what? We won't try and change you, but we will support LGBT rights and inclusion at this company, right. whether you're on that train or not. Um, we as a company uh, support this and yeah. we, we want our employees who are members of the LGBT community to feel supported and, and, and feel welcomed. And I think that also, if you have something like that, then it, it also sort of makes it welcoming where, you know, you have this, this thing where people who might have questions or whatever, they see that there's, you know, there's a group of people having fun here and it's like, all right, we can, you know, let's, let's, let's talk. Let's sort of like learn, let's learn together yeah. and things like that. Yeah. You know? um, and it's yeah. not just like, Oh, that person's over there. I don't know how I, I don't want, I don't want to ask the wrong thing or whatever. Yeah. You know? Like so. what, what's, what, what's, what, what's, what, what am I not? Yeah. Right. Allowed right, to right. say. Yeah. What, what words am I not allowed to use? Yeah. This. I mean, that's the thing. Is this is important and come to the table it's and talk about crucial, it. but it should. All, it can also be fun. You know, like yeah. In, in well, I mean, in, you know, I, I had an HR uh, an HR partner at a, a at a at a um, at, at a previous company let me know that she didn't understand trans issues. Uh, and um, she really wanted to be educated on it. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. I think the reason why we've gotten to where we are in the United States as Americans, uh, in you know, in our current um, with our current president, is because of a failure for us to come to the table and talk. Right. Um, you know, in in social media, uh, whatever it may be. Let's have that conversation, um, you know, not, not in being insulting or, you right. know, uh, denouncing any particular belief uh, or saying you're stupid or you're wrong, but coming to the table with questions and understanding. Uh, you may not agree with a per particular person's lifestyle uh, or choices or how they identify, but you should sure as hell support them. Uh, yeah. You should sure as hell uh, understand. You know, um, you may yeah. not have to agree with it, but you should respect it and you should understand, you should 
understand it. Strive to understand it. And also, yeah, I think just being, being around people of different backgrounds, you know, it's a lot easier to say, oh, you know, you know how they are when you've never met any, you know, people like that or whatever. But then when yeah. you work next to them and you solve problems, oh, that was a, you know, that was a, that was a clever solution or whatever, Alyssa, right. you know, and, and and that's that's I mean that's what's moved the needle over the last twenty years anyway is everyone you know a lot more people know you know have a gay friend who's who's come out and and uh you know or, or what have you and and it's you know the sort of uh prevalence of it you're like okay now i un- i I understand that this is just another human being you know smart thoughtful yeah it's it's like my yeah. my uh my wife's favorite movie is train wreck and there's oh, yeah. this point where this woman at a party says um yeah i don't know you know i don't understand those you know those gay people and then you know the the main character is like uh they're people <laughs> you yeah, know it's right, like right. uh we're human um yeah. you know we bleed red like to eat uh, food <laughs> Yeah, Bro. exactly. Exactly. It's like when nine Things. eleven happens. You yeah. know, it's I, I I didn't understand the Muslim the Muslim faith, but I went out there and read about it and, yeah. and read the Quran and and un- tried to understand the Muslim religion um, before I said anything about it. You know, right. the problem is we as Americans come out and we say a lot of stupid, ignorant things without fully understanding it and educating ourselves on it. That's what I do not agree with, is right. someone taking an opinion or a position on something without researching it and understanding it. Yeah. Understand both sides of conversation, you know. Um, sure. Anyway. Yeah, sit in your discomfort and, and learn about it too, though. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you got, I was telling someone the other day, it's like, if you want to find news uh, that supports your position on something and you, you can go out and Google it and find people that support you. That doesn't make you right. Right. What you need to do is go out and Google it and find out more about it, whether they right. agree with your position or not. It's like people that choose to only watch, um, you know, more liberal news channels than more conservative news channels. They listen to the people that agree with them, agree with their opinion. I like to watch the BBC. I like to watch NPR. I want to hear both sides of the conversation. That's how I live my life. I don't want to listen to people that are yes men and are going to tell me what I want to hear and what I support. I want to hear both sides of the narrative. I want to hear both sides of the conversation. Right. So yeah, this is, this has been great. So I want to sort of uh, move us into the future here now that you're kind of uh, you know, you've written your autobiography or you're, you're in the process. Uh, yep. So what are, what are your next challenges that you've, you've got planned for yourself? Cause that, uh, clearly you don't uh, uh, you don't sit still for very long. So what do you, what are your plans for say like the next five years for yourself and night Inc and, and your book? Yeah, I'm, uh, so I'm writing a screenplay and that is all I'll say about that. Um, okay. I am, uh, yeah, I'm writing a screenplay. I'm um, uh, writing an autobiography. I'm writing the the new pay security book. I'm right uh, right now. Um, gosh, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm you know building a new house with my wife. We just got married in January. Cool. Um, she's uh, left her full time employment to come work for me at Briar and Thorn. Wow. Um, uh, we've started a company together. She's a partner of mine at Night Inc. Um, we are starting uh, a venture capital fund together, and we're investing in startups. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a day trader. Really no, getting you know, so, know you know, yeah, I'm I'm uh, a day trading and doing swing trading uh, with COVID nineteen and made some awesome investment opportunities in the stock market. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing a lot. Uh, I'm ready to start this new book in my life yeah. with my, with my wife and our new life in Las Vegas. Uh, and we're building a house. We're just, uh, yeah, I'm having fun. I'm having a good time. I love it. And you, you mentioned before too, that you're, you're never quite out of the vulnerability assessment game and stuff too. Like you still, cause, yeah. cause you're, you, you do a lot of writing and obviously other things, but like you still really get a lot of enjoyment out of finding vulnerabilities and hacking into I do. yeah yeah talk about yeah that yeah bit. it's i you know to me you don't have to completely abandon it just because you know uh you're you're not you, you don't want to be in a, in a interpreter shell you right. know all day long doesn't mean you have to completely give it up i've figured out how to actually blend it with content creation right and it's making for very unique content it makes yeah. me a very unique voice in cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, um, vulnerability assessment, vulnerability management, uh, can be woven into everything you do. And I want to talk about this for a moment, Chris, one of the, um, 
one of the things I'm really struggling with right now are the people that believe you cannot be a hacker unless you're a programmer. Hmm. And I, I couldn't disagree more with that statement. Uh, I have met some amazing hackers. I have met the most impressive hacker was that I've ever met was a woman and couldn't write a single line of code if her life hmm. depended on it. And, you know, and I think it's just this more elite than thou attitude that's so systemic in our industry. Right. And the reason why I left cybersecurity for a while after I sold my last company um, and, you know, and, and it, it needs to be changed because it, it creates less of an inclusive culture. Uh, just because you can't program doesn't mean you can't be an amazing hacker. Doesn't mean you can't publish vulnerabilities. I've, I've got so many CVEs to my name and I could not even write anything beyond a printf statement. Right. Um, you know, you do not need to be a programmer to be a hacker. Um, I had someone just today message me on LinkedIn and said, you know, uh, I, I'm going to vote for you for this Hacker of the Year award that I was nominated for. Um, I want to find out if you can write a buffer overflow. What the hell does that have to do with being a hacker? Mm. What I mean, you know, what you're not a hacker unless you can write a buffer overflow come on and i mean a lot of the applications today are web applications like yeah, <laughs> yeah. like what the hell are you talking about you know it's a lot of i mean you know everything is moved to web applications everything is right. no i mean it's rare to find a setup.exe file anymore in applications everything's moved to the web um i i don't even know why that's still a thing i i look yeah. there's a lot of people that a lot of your listeners are going to disagree with me fine, disagree with me mm -hmm. and let's have a conversation about it. But, you know, whether it's the VPN uh, vulnerabilities that I published, um, whether it's the, you know, API vulnerabilities that I published, whatever it is, not a single vulnerability I've ever published required me to be a programmer. Okay, well, let's talk about that a little bit. There's, you know, like you say, we're, we're cyber work now. And so we, we talk about the sort of job industry aspects of it. So if you are feeling intimidated because you can't program, but you want to be a hacker, like what are the, what are the things that you, you can sort of make up the difference with? I mean, obviously, you, yeah. there's not even a difference to be made up necessarily, but in the eyes of people who are hiring you and might want to, you know, throw roadblocks in front of you, like, well, write a buffer over yeah, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, let's, let's ask ourselves what hacking is. Yeah. Hacking is, is, is creating a stimulus, sending a stimulus to an application or product, whatever it may be, uh, a service, sending a stimulus that the developer didn't expect to receive. Mm -hmm. That's hacking. It's right. creating a stimulus that the developer didn't expect to receive hmm. and attempting to exploit that. Now, when I'm hacking, when I'm looking for vulnerabilities in something, I'm analyzing how it works. As a hacker, you're trying to figure out how things work yep. so you can figure out what kind of stimulus might be something the developer didn't expect to receive. Right. Um, when I was publishing those API vulnerabilities, I was simply just intercepting traffic uh, with the mobile app of the bank. Uh, and if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find that video mm -hmm. of me hacking the bank through the API server. I walk you through intercepting your mobile app traffic for the bank and looking at it and analyzing it and figuring out how it works. That's a hacker. You're, you're analyzing something and figuring out how it works and then figuring out, Oh, well, what happens if I change this field? What happens if instead of submitting my account number at the bank, I submit Chris's account number at the bank? Mm -hmm. What will happen? And lo and behold, the API server for the bank accepted it and allowed me to transfer money from yeah. Chris's account to my account or change the pin code for Chris's Visa ATM card uh, uh, instead of mine. I don't like anything about this example. <laughs> um, you know, in our, on, in, our, in our hypothetical yeah, uh, sure, situation. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and that's really what hacking is. And, you know, uh, so I, I, I challenge anyone to stand up to me and tell me why I'm wrong. Because right. in every single scenario, it's, it's understanding how an application works, understanding, you know, and a lot of times you don't even get access to the source code for something. Right. You know, you're, so you're still trying to figure out how it works yep. uh, and what it's doing. Um, you know, and so to me as a, as a packet monkey, as somebody that likes to hang out at layer three, there are so many vulnerabilities that I found simply by just analyzing packets and analyzing data at layer three, uh, you yep. know, and sending a stimulus to an application that it didn't expect. 
So I, I think this is a great debate. I think this is an awesome thing that, that uh, you know, I want to have. This is a discussion, a dialogue that in respectful discourse yep. should be had. Uh, because there are too many people out there who believe that you're not a good enough hacker. You're not a hacker at all unless you know how to code. Yeah. I think it's wrong. Yeah. And again, it's leaving people behind that don't need to be left yeah. behind. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, we need to welcome as many people as we can to this industry, to right. cybersecurity, and they don't all have to program. What about yeah, social engineers? The challenges are only going to get more pernicious and strange as we go on. I agree. And, 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 and adversaries want nothing more than to exclude people who might think differently or color outside the lines right. just simply because they're not a programmer. Yeah, this is a color out the line, outside the lines kind of a job. It is. It is. Yeah. So, all right. One, one last uh, bonus question for you. For people who want to get to know Alyssa Knight better, where can they find you on social media? Yes. So yes. if you Time haven't yet, I've finally reached a thousand subscribers on YouTube. And in order to join the partner program, yes. Um, in order to join the partner program, uh, I need to get like 40,000 hours of watch time. So go on my channel, watch my YouTube Let videos. Yeah, check yeah, them out. Support me. So if you support my content, if you support me, definitely watch my videos on my YouTube channel. What's the channel um, called again? Or it's, it's just listen night? Yeah, it's youtube.com slash C slash Alyssa Knight. Um, okay. I do a weekly video upload, a weekly live broadcast. I'm going to be in the, doing another uh, live broadcast today. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Alyssa Knight, and that's Alyssa with an I yep. and Knight with a K. And yep. uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so follow me, subscribe Alyssa's very, to me. very prolific on LinkedIn as well. I, I see yes. stuff on there all the time. Got a lot of good yeah, I've got articles, like vids, everything's kind of there. It's a good clearinghouse. Yeah, yeah, it's got I've got like 30,000 followers now on LinkedIn. Um so definitely follow me um there and connect with me and if if you're looking for ways to to support me, support other content creators, like and share our stuff. Yeah. Uh you know, subscribe to my YouTube Pass channel, hit that little bell icon to be notified of new uploads. Yes. You know, it, for those of you who who are reading articles, uh watching videos, there's no better way to support them by hitting like and sharing it. There you go. And uh, check out, if you're so inclined, Hacking Connected Cars on Wiley. Yes, please. Definitely go buy my book and write yeah. a great review about it on Amazon. I'm Thanks. getting some trolls on Amazon that are writing oh. some negative reviews about my book. So if you like my book, please People who definitely want to continue positive. Hacking Connected Cars. Yes, yes. <laughs> write a positive review. Okay. So. Well, Alyssa, thank you again for your time and talents. It's always such a treat to get to talk to you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I love being on your show. Thanks for the invite to join you again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you as ever for uh, all of you for listening and watching. If you enjoyed yep. today's video, you can find many more of them on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyber work with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search cyber work with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. And as Alyssa said, uh, nothing helps us better than to give us a five-star rating and a nice review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you do it. So please, if people have been doing it, it's been helping. Thank you. Uh, for a free month of the InfoSec skills platform that you heard about at the start of today's show, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash skills and sign up for an account. In the coupon code, type cyberwork, all one word, all small letters, no spaces, and get your free month. Thank you once again to Alyssa Knight, and thank you all for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week.